Hey guys, what's going on um, FRT community? Just wanted to reach out to you, man. I'm getting lots of questions over um, care of these uh, COVID-19 patients that are presenting with uh, ARDS-like symptoms. And I want to put a disclaimer out there first of all and tell you that, that the purpose of this video is to, is to provide you with a source of information Okay, so down in the comments section in this video, you're going to find five different links. Okay, these links are going to take you to the International Pulmonologist Consensus, their website on the guidelines, COVID-19. You're going to find a link to the World Health Organization's guidelines. You're going to get a link to Society of Critical Care Medicine, which I really suggest you take a look at because the format and the way they lay it out is so simple. So I really like that link. Uh, you're also going to get a, a, a link to the AARC where you can find lots of information on not just guidelines and caring for, but also information on things like what's going on with the stockpiling of ventilators, uh, what's their recommendation for multiple patients on one ventilator, which is just crazy to me. I can't even believe that we're even asking that question, but I get it. Uh, you know, dire times here. So we got we to gotta ask those questions and, and, and AARC put a statement out saying, Absolutely not, right? And then uh, also a link to the ARDSnet protocol where you can actually download the actual uh, document itself. So it probably prints out on one or two pages and it's pretty easy to follow. Okay, so that's all this is, is just a stockpile of resources. Uh, I'm just going to highlight a few things from what I'm hearing um, from therapists that are out there actually on the front lines. Now, I'm not able to go into the hospital right now uh, because of the hospitals actually close their door to students and to uh, instructors that are desiring to do clinicals in their facilities. And so I'm not actually in the hospital right now uh, working, but I'm in a lot of contact with people from all over the world. Uh, and so hearing and getting a lot of the same questions. So I'm just going to try to approach them uh, here. And those links that I'm going to put in the comments are going to be the answers to those questions where you find them. Okay. I don't need to come in here and teach you the ArtsNet protocol. Okay, you can look at that protocol. You're all, you know, either about to be respiratory therapist or you already are respiratory therapist. And here's the deal. This, this, my, my hope, trying to find a silver lining here is that this ordeal leads to a greater awareness of respiratory therapists, not just in, in the healthcare setting as a whole, but I think this is really our time to shine and to show our worth uh, to the healthcare team. And most importantly, we're going to do that by everybody all of a sudden is interested in the ARSNET protocol. What, what, how do, how, what does it mean? How do you apply it? Da, 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 this, that. Well, it's, it's funny that we had to get to this for people to really start getting engaged in what we should already be well-versed in. And so I hope this sparks everyone's interest in seeking out more knowledge and, and, and just to never stop learning. When you, when you get the ArsNet protocol down like the back of your hand, then learn something else, right? Apply it to driving pressure and apply it to, you know, the P100 and, and all these different other elements that are often overlooked, okay? So that's what I hope comes out of this. Now, let's get to the meat and potatoes of this. Uh, ventilation, from a ventilation standpoint, um, first of all, what I'm, trying, what I'm hearing and what I'm seeing is, is that uh, there's no need to prolong intubation. If the patient is, is, is definitely not getting better, and you're seeing a decline, then get them intubated, get them on mechanical ventilation, and get this, um, these, these, these therapeutic settings implemented earlier rather than later uh, is the first thing I'm hearing. Now, when it comes to ventilation, we know we're using 4 to 8 mLs per kilo. That's straight off the Arginet protocol, and that makes sense. Everybody knows that, okay? But I want to remind you, the Arginet protocol is very clear when it says that if your plateau pressures are less than 30, which is the second point I want to make, you're going 4 to 8 mLs per kilo with a target goal of a plateau pressure less than 30. Now, if that plateau pressure is less than 30 and you have a patient who is breath stacking, then the ARSNET protocol very clearly states that you can increase the tidal volume up by 1 mL per kilo in an attempt to fix the breath stacking. You see, the patient's breath stack because the volume that is set is not meeting their volume desired. So you have them on a tidal volume of 450, but maybe they're looking for 480. So one mL per kilo increase 
in tidal volume may fix that breath stacking. It may stop that patient from taking two breaths back to back, which equates basically to a 900 ml tidal volume. So you want to be aware of that, okay? Assuming and, and, and obviously in conjunction with your plateau pressures and your max is 8 ml per kilo. So the other thing in regards to ventilation very quick here is just don't, don't overventilate your patients. We always get caught up, not just RTs, but nurses and doctors. And we get caught up in getting our patients to a, to a normal state. We, that CO2 has to be between 35 and 45. The pH has to be between 7.35 and 7.45. And, and that's, not, that's not the case. You're going to work your butt off and you're going to put a lot of strain and stress on the uh, functioning units of, of the lungs, the alveoli, as you, 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 you try to get their CO2 back to a normal range in an effort to get their pH up to greater than 7.35. So don't do that. Understand there's a difference in, in normal and adequate. Okay, and our ARSNET protocol is very clear in this. It's shooting for a pH of 7.30. So you're okay. So your CO2 is a little high and your pH is 7.31. Don't go in there, try to increase the tidal volume or increase the rate um, because you're panicking because it's not normal. It's adequate, okay? So follow and trust the protocol, okay, in the research. Now, some of these other organizations even, I saw somewhere where it even recommended less than that, like 725. And so the point is, is, is just simply don't try to overventilate for the sake of normal, okay? Understand adequacy in, in contrast to, to normal, okay? And then the same thing with oxygenation. Everything I'm seeing is uh, pointing to early therapeutic PEEP levels. Now, a lot of times we start at five. Why? Because that's what we do. Okay, maybe eight. That's what we do. Eight and above is considered therapeutic. But a lot of these patients, from what I'm seeing, they're, they're requiring PEEPs of 12 to 16 okay, to, um, to sustain an actual uh, functioning FRC and, and, and to achieve uh, adequate oxygenation. Okay, so when I say adequate, you don't want a saturation of 100%. You don't need a PaO2 of 95, okay? You're looking for sats, um, and, and, and this also varies. Some documents you'll see between 92 and 96, and you'll see other documents where they're saying adequate oxygenation uh, you know, is acceptable uh, and adequate from 88% up to, up to 94%. My point here is, is, is you're not having to achieve 98, 99, 100%, okay? So, so be judicial with your FIO2s. Understand that the higher the FIO2 you're using, the more risk you're putting the patient at, more atelectasis is due to nitrogen washout, especially when you get up to 90 and 100% FIO2 and you're sitting there on a peep of, 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 of eight, right? That's obviously uh, not probably the best uh, settings for that patient. You can get that peep up, get your FIO2 down, you'll decrease your 8 to 8 difference, uh, improve your PF ratio, and, and uh, hopefully have better outcomes with your patients. Now, when you're talking about PEEP, everybody wants to know, well, how do I know when too much PEEP is too much PEEP? Well, the answer to that is you just have to watch and understand that PEEP, when it gets too high, will affect your cardiac output. And this manifests itself at the bedside by you monitoring blood pressure. So if you're, you're increasing PEEP or you're at a level of PEEP and you increase it further and your blood pressure goes down, then you need to ask yourself, is this too much PEEP? Did I just decrease venous return and cause a decrease, drop in my cardiac output and maybe this PEEP is too high? Maybe 18 was okay, but, but 22 was too much. And so you need to dial it back so that you still have adequate blood pressure, and then you have to go back to your FIO2, okay? So be aware of that when you're out there working with these PEEP levels and these higher PEEP levels. And this is always, this, isn't, this has nothing to do with right now. This is, this is every single day respiratory therapy, right? So, so be aware of that. Um, and then if you find that uh, your therapeutic um, application of PEEP and mechanical ventilation and all that stuff is not improving uh, your PF ratio, you have a very small improvement in your PaO2. Uh, you just can't, you're just having a, just a really hard time oxygenating your patient, or you're seeing a decline in your patient's oxygenation even after the application of, of these high peeps with, uh, you know, these therapeutic peeps with, with whatever FIL2 is requiring. Then uh, early proning is, uh, from what I can tell, highly uh, recommended.
And when I say early proning, I want you guys to understand this. I know they are limiting patient, I mean, healthcare providers going in these rooms, rightfully so. Okay. But if there's talk about proning a patient, the guidelines are clear that an RT must be present. You, you have to understand that our role in this situation, when you're talking about taking a patient from the supine position and flipping them over, you are the airway expert that should be present maintaining that airway. Do not put that uh, burden on another healthcare provider who is not as skilled as you are in that area. Okay, so be present when the proning is happening. The last thing I want to touch on here is the question about the implementation of non-invasive therapies uh, such as uh, such as BiPAP, CPAP, um, AirVo, or high-flow nasal cannula. There's varying consensuses on this. Not everybody agrees, but everybody does agree that that these non-invasive therapies do lead to a greater aerosolization of the secretions, therefore putting um, more of the virus airborne and potentially posing a risk, an increased risk uh, to the providers taking care of that patient, okay? So um, from what I can tell, uh, and just talking to people, non-invasive, uh, from what I can find, hasn't really shown much results, uh, positive results anyway, so, so we're kind of just skipping that to reduce the risk and just get them intubated and get them taken care of that way. Now, like I said, the links below, We'll go into either further depth into pre-intubation, into the intubation procedure, into the even more in depth into the mechanical ventilation side of these things, and and we'll keep you um, up to date. And so I encourage you to dive into this. If you're out there or working and you're and you're and you're apprehensive and you're scared, um, education, being prepared for these scenarios as they come up. Um, or is going to be your best answer, okay? And so, um, so you know, prepare yourself, teach yourself, educate yourself, get into these links, dive into them, and share them with your colleagues. That's the biggest thing. Share them. If you're a student, visit these links and learn these links and learn some of this stuff that's probably maybe a little bit more advanced from what you may recognize or know, but you can always still learn it, okay? Um, you're going to have to be prepared for it someday. This won't be the last time. So anyways, guys, I just want to let all the respiratory therapists out there know that I'm thinking about you, praying for you. I love you guys. I know the work you're doing is appreciated and it's greatly valuable for your patients. Just want everybody to be safe. Okay, so be safe.